The following podcast is a proud member of the Blue Collar Roots Network. Find all the shows by visiting bluecollarroots.com. That's sort of a convoluted thing there. As much as possible, you want people to be self-motivated, self-motivated. Hey there, you found the Service Business Mastery Podcast with Tersh Blizzett. I'm Brian Orr, and today on the podcast, Tersh kind of interviews me at the last second. I didn't anticipate it, but he asks me about metrics, software, and performance-based pay. Tersh just let me know that he's going to interview me about technician metrics. That's correct. Let me tell you a little story first. Do you mind if I tell a little story? Sure, go ahead. Just real quick. So I came from a business before I started my own, that was a performance-based pay business, a flat rate business. That's how the technicians were paid, or they just build it out? No, that's how the technicians were paid. Okay, cool. And I did very well in that system, but I didn't like some of the things that happened within that company because of that. Namely, guys who made the most money were often the shadiest technicians. And even then, like my previous employer, I never say their name, I very rarely ever say their name, because I'm very honest about my experience, but they were a great place to work. They were really good to me, and they had a lot of really good technicians who I learned a lot from. So even their worst technicians weren't, they were bad, but they weren't like some places. But often what happened was the guys who were the least thorough were often the ones who I observed making the most money, or at least who bragged about making the most money. And then later when I got into management and actually saw the numbers, I saw that that was the case. And so I've always had a mixed relationship with metrics. I've never been a money-motivated person. I've always wanted to – I'm very idealistic. I want to build the best company that has the best customer service and all this kind of thing. And so I've had to learn to get more into metrics as I've gone, which means that I haven't always done everything that I should do as far as tracking metrics. I want to just lay that out there. So you're going to interview me about what I currently do, and I'm going to tell you about what I wish that I did if I had to make it from scratch right now because some of it isn't the best. Um, But I'll be transparent. I'll be authentic with you, Tersh. So ask away. That's all I ask is that you just be 100% honest with me. 100% is a lot of honesty to ask for. I mean, it depends on what you're going to ask. At least 80%. Okay, I'll be 87% honest. I promise. Great. Yeah. Scout's honor. (laughs) Scout's honor. Why create your own program versus buying one off the shelf? Okay. So we first have to introduce to everybody that I created my own program instead of buying one off the shelf. It's mostly because in 2009, when I built my own program, there really wasn't much on the shelf. The shelf had a CD-ROM that you would load onto a central computer, and that's how you would dispatch, and that's how you would manage your customer base and manage metrics and all that. And I just had this vision of do everything from the field that I could do in the office. I always wanted that. I wanted to be able to have a fully distributed team. When I started my business, I always told myself that I was never going to leave the field because I just love fixing air conditioners so much. And I actually do. That is the truth. And I still, whenever I do actually fix something, I wonder to myself, why on earth don't I just do this instead of all the other stuff I don't like doing? But I digress. So when I started the business, that's what I thought I would always do is always fix things with my hands. So I thought, well, I'm going to build a program so that I can do everything I need to do as an owner from the field with nothing but a internet connection. And this was at the time when the fastest internet speeds were 3G. So we bought the very first iPads that hit the market we had. And they were just janky as all get out. They were slow. They were everything. And so we had to build a website that was going to work with that. And so we built our own customer relationship management, CRM slash dispatching slash billing slash email management slash everything into that program because I didn't know any better. I didn't know that that was something that you shouldn't do. And it worked really, really well for us initially. Right off the bat, we had a better program than most of the things that were out there in the marketplace, especially specifically for our needs. And as we went along, we just kept creating this Frankenstein and adding things onto it over the years until it's become what it is today. Is the program still something that you continue to update or have you outsourced that? Or The answer is yes. I spend a lot of money on a yearly basis tweaking that website. We are just now today releasing customer on-screen proposal signing. So today's the first day that that's happening where we send a customer a proposal and they sign it right on their screen, whatever device they have with their mouse or with their finger, and then it immediately saves it as a PDF and sends it right back to us, which is pretty cool. That is very nice, especially when you have a customer that says they never saw the invoice or the proposal or anything. And I know a lot of other softwares have had that for years. That's just one that we haven't had for a while. So Everything else about the program was very advanced though. Everything else was perfect, except that. 
That was like the cherry on top of this gigantic, disgusting looking cake that is my website. Do you have any capabilities of letting customers schedule on their own? Yes. So they can click on your website and see what's available? Well, that's tricky, isn't it? Yes. And yes, there is an interface for that. Boy, it's been a long time since I've looked at that interface, so I have no idea what it looks like. Isn't that embarrassing? <laughs> we, we found that customers don't generally use it, though, probably because we don't market it. Oh, okay. That was going to be my question. I didn't know if your customer base was kind of at the age where they weren't super tech savvy or if it was because they just didn't know it was there. I think it's probably both. Our target market is 40 plus. So on the young side of that, there's still people who use it, but they still don't prefer it. It's really our generation that prefer the online scheduling system. And so I built that system 2010 and just nobody ever used it. And so we really haven't spent a lot of time developing it. The challenge with that type of thing is it's just when you have a company where you've got you know 20 technicians on the road, you really have to create these sort of windows of availability that creates a challenge. And so what we're working on now is not that I want people to steal my proprietary name for this, but this thing that I've called the master algorithm that actually suggests open time windows based on what's on schedule and how many people are working and what zones they're in and so on and so forth to actually produce a result that will support dispatcher CSRs and customers in scheduling. But until that's out, it's really, really hard for customers to schedule their own times and have it be like set in stone. That sounds like it fixes all the problems that I would present to anybody who has that type of scheduling capabilities. All the systems that exist are all based on what slots do you have open? And isn't that the $10 million question in a service business? It changes every five minutes. Exactly. And even in the human side, we make mistakes, let alone if you're going to just let a program run and do its thing. It's just another thing to manage. So unless you have a good block of your customer base who is interacting with it, there's no sense in managing it. You might as well just not manage it. So the way it works right now is it gives them ranges that they can choose. They choose it. It throws it on a pending schedule up on our site. So they basically... They can put in all their details and their address and you know what's going on, and it throws it up straight onto our schedule. So it's the main thing that makes it different on our site than a lot of these systems. A lot of these systems really just kind of like fill out a form, and then you have to convert it. This actually throws it straight onto our schedule, but it shows it as pending scheduled. And so we still have to interact with it to say, okay, that will work, or no, it won't. But the benefit is, is because it's going straight on our calendar, we're usually doing that in a matter of minutes versus getting back to them a day later and saying, oh, well, I know you said you want me there at 8 a.m., but I can't be kind of a thing. How do you take care of things if they fill out the forms after hours? Just the next morning, you reach out to them if it's not going to work or if it is? So the way I work is we have somebody who's actually an after-hours dispatcher up until 10 p.m. every night of the week. Oh, well, y'all are fancy. And so I have somebody who's checking that stuff all the way up to 10 p.m. So the only time something like that could slip would be past 10. With your program, if you had to do it over again right now, would you still do it the same way you're doing it now or... If you could use one off the shelf at this moment, which one would you choose? Or is that a million dollar question? Oh boy, it's a really loaded question. So part of my challenge is I don't know everything that's out there. I've heard really good things about Service Titan. It seems to be a very good off the shelf product. There was a product called um, HVAC CEO, I think a while ago that I saw that looked interesting. For me, the main things with HVAC specifically, but really any service business is, is it going to do the CRM side, which is the customer relationship management? Is it going to keep good records on my customers and what's gone on with them? Is it going to do the dispatching side well, which is mostly about managing a calendar? And am I going to be able to bill out of it? And so there's certain softwares like people will use the QuickBooks Online or the FreshBooks or sites like that, and they'll do a good job with the billing side, but they don't have anything to do with the CRM and the dispatching side. And then there's also all these additional things you want to build in, which is independent employee metrics, which is part of what we're talking about here. You want to build in the ability to manage contracts. Service contracts are huge. So we have this whole module. You want to have the ability to track time and track time in a completely distributed way where people don't have to come to a central point. We have this time approval system where you have people who log their time that's based on the calls that they interact with. So it auto logs it based on when they put themselves on standby and when they put themselves on call and at call and all that kind of stuff. When they complete a call, it all logs that on their timesheets and then it goes through an approval process so a manager can approve it. There's all these different moving pieces to a service business. And so to answer your question, I still haven't seen anything that I think does all of those things well. And while my site doesn't do all of them perfectly, it works really well for me. So if I knew I was going to scale my business to the size that I have, then I would definitely have done the same thing again. The trouble is, is that when people ask me that question of like, well, what happens if you were going to start again today? If I was going to start again today, I would be exhausted. I'm just going to be me and like two of my best guys. And that would be it. Like I wouldn't grow. 
because growing is exhausting. That's a young man's game. I don't think I could do it again with my current mindset. In that case, I wouldn't build this gigantic software that I've built. What is your software missing? Stability. It is stable because I pay people to fix it every time something breaks, but that makes it expensive to maintain. So that's big. Inventory control is something that I really want to see it do better. And then metrics. I get metrics out of it, but the interface for how I view the metrics isn't the best. So I get a ranking of billable per hour by employee and their average drive times and things like that. So that gives me a really good way to kind of rank them against each other. But I would like to see the interface be a little more clean. I would like to be able to send them those metrics on a weekly basis automatically. And I don't currently have that, but we will. We're working on all those things. But then the inventory tracking is huge. I would really like it, the site, to produce weekly reports the warehouse manager can pull their parts on a weekly basis for them automatically. And currently, our flat rate just isn't granular enough for that. It doesn't uh, track to a specific SKU. And then there's just a lot of things like refrigerant is a huge challenge because you have a guy who uses five pounds, but it's got to track against a tank so that then we know when that tank is up. And then we turn that tank in and then we get him another tank. There's just things like that that are tricky to manage with inventory in a service business when you're not using the whole SKU every time. And so those are all things that we're working on as well that I wish we had. I've seen some programs where they can email your supplier. If you're like the size of my company, they could email our supply house every night with the inventory that was used that day. And then the next morning, the supply house can bring your parts over to you. And then you can just restock the guy's truck that day. Yeah, that was actually our intention. Johnstone has a system like that. And that was actually something that we really have it all built. There's just a lot of things you have to think about because if you're going to have a supplier auto emailed, you better make sure that it's right because otherwise you're going to end up paying for stuff that you didn't want. And so the way we decided to do it was to have an intermediary approval process where it generates the report and the warehouse manager reviews it and then it gets sent over on a weekly basis. And really the only thing that's prevented us from doing that is just the accuracy of some of those partial things. And it's just a lot of parts that we use, like refrigerant being one of the most expensive parts that we consistently use that we just have to be really, really thoughtful about how you do that because you can't send an email over saying, give me five pounds of our 22. That's not how that works. Or give me a half sheet of duckboard. It has to be in those full quantities. It has to be a box of duckboard. It has to be a bucket of mastic. It has to be a, or pookie as some people call it. It's a whole other topic. It makes me mad. <laughs> call it pookie all the time. So every business is going to be different with those sorts of things that, that are sold in box or bulk quantities. And so those have to be tracked on a running basis. And then once you hit a certain quantity, then it triggers. And that requires your technicians being super detailed with what they do, which they need to be. And that's one of the main reasons why I want it. But it is a challenge. It's not something that just happens easily. It takes a lot of work. That's pretty much all I have on the flaws with your system. You did pretty good. Okay, thanks. It's a pretty good system, I think. What's the importance of tracking the service technician? Why should an owner even track a service tech's moves throughout the day? The obvious reason is because the service tech really is your product. That's really what you're selling in a service business. It doesn't matter what type of service business you have. How are you going to fix things if you do track them? What changes? So if you can track somebody's travel time, what do you do to change that? Well, it's all comparative. In a vacuum, one technician's statistics mean nothing. But when you compare another technician to the average and you compare them to the best technician and you can show them those metrics and everybody's confident that those metrics are pretty good, Well, now that is a tremendous motivating factor. It's been shown time and time again that people only focus on money as their primary motivating factor when there aren't other things that matter more to them. And being just general competitiveness is something that we can all relate to. And it doesn't have to be ugly. It doesn't have to be aggressive. It can just be like, hey, here's the numbers. Most people want to win when they see those numbers. And it really helps motivate people for them to be able to just kind of see where they stand. Do you ever find that it demotivates any technicians? Well, sure. It demotivates the worst ones, usually. Or that's their excuse. Sure. And we've had this conversation. Like, a healthy business needs to cut its bottom 10% of its employees on a yearly basis. I mean, that sounds awful, but that's the truth. Because you have to be. And so if you're not measuring, this is unfair. So those of you who hear this and take this as criticism, please don't. But I forget what comedian it was. It's like, I hear people say all the time that they don't like standardized testing. I can understand why you wouldn't like the part where they actually find out what you know And it's the same thing with metrics. It's like there's a point to be said that there's more to it than metrics for sure because there is. There's customer service. There's a lot of other things. But you can mix that in there. You can mix in customer satisfaction and callbacks and all those things. Those are really the three things that we look at. Okay, there's really four. There's the type of work that you do because if you're a senior tech and all you're doing is callbacks, that's a different kind of world. So you have to kind of match people up with people who do similar things. So the type of work that you do, 
what is your callback rate? Meaning how often do you have to go back and fix something that you did wrong or somebody else has to go back and fix something you did wrong? What's your customer satisfaction ratio? Are people happy or unhappy with you from a very basic standpoint? And then finally is your efficiency and productivity. I mean, efficiency and productivity is always measured against a metric, which is profitability. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, right? For how much money do you bring in for every hour that you work? And that's not to say that that's the main thing. That's the most important thing, but it is a thing. It's pretty important. Yeah, it's pretty darn important to a business, you know, surviving. Are you able to calculate your net profit per hour per technician? We track net profit per hour. So we track overhead per hour. We track gross profit per hour. We track net profit per hour all on our P&L. Then we also track average gross receipts. So we track the profitability per hour. And we do it per billable hour. So we exclude things like training and we exclude things like travel time and all that. So we just look at... What is your gross per billable hour? That gives us a pretty good approximation because we're comparing it directly to a billable hour. The, their direct costs aren't going to change too much based on a billable hour because I don't like guys fighting with dispatch about travel time. And so that helps eliminate that because now that's being excluded. We're looking at that separately because we're wanting to see if you're milking travel. And so we compare that to others to see if you're gaming that system. But we're excluding that from the metric and we're really just looking at what are you bringing in per hour that you're on a job? Perfect. Are you guys paid flat rate or are they paid by the hour? My guys are all paid hourly. I'm still getting through my hangups from my previous employer. I like the idea of paying flat rate. It is a little more like you need to have a really strong service auditing arm of your business if you're doing flat rate to make sure that everything's being done properly. That's huge because it's directly related to their pay now. I don't have a problem with flat rate as long as it isn't encouraging bad behavior. As long as it's encouraging good behavior and punishing bad behavior, then I'm all for it. I just see in a lot of big businesses, sometimes the management loses touch with it, and it ends up being that the guys who aren't doing the right thing are the ones who end up making money, and that shouldn't be that way. It should be the ones who are the most efficient, have the best customer service, help with employee morale, are willing to help each other, and bill out. Those are the guys who should get paid the most. Yeah, I feel like the larger the company, that's where you find the most people taking advantage of that situation. When you have two or three or four guys that are being paid flat rate, it's easier to manage those guys because you see them so often. You have more of a relationship with them versus if you had 60 or 150 service technicians. You could have 10% of them flying under the radar, making big bucks, being less than honest about the entire situation. Okay, let's give an example here. Because here's what a manager would look at. A manager would say, well, yeah, but he doesn't have a high callback rate and his customers love him, okay, right? But he just did an entire compressor in an hour and a half. Okay, did he flow nitrogen? Did he do the proper acid protocol on that compressor? Is he being really thorough with his vacuum? Maybe he is. Maybe he's literally just that good, but maybe he's not. And maybe he's just skipping things that nobody will ever know until that compressor fails again two years from now. And that compressor failing again two years from now doesn't go against his metrics, right? That's the challenge. And that's what I saw very much at my previous employer. There weren't guys who were scam artists. They just weren't thorough. And by not being thorough, they were just slamming in parts. And the customer wouldn't necessarily know within the warranty period that they weren't doing the right thing. Or they may not even catch on that the entire process of it. They may not have caught on that that was a direct result of them only doing it for an hour and a half or only taking an hour and a half to do a job that should be four or six hours. Exactly. And and I'm not saying like, there's always a way to build a better mousetrap. And I'm all for guys who build a better mousetrap. You know, you use big half inch hoses when you're pulling your vacuum. So you're pulling it down in five minutes when it takes another guy an hour. Well, bravo. Absolutely. But in a small business, you can know that, you know, which one of your guys are engaging technically. And that's the thing that drove me crazy. I've always been sort of a technical first guy. And you see a lot of guys who are more salesy, meaning that they're good with the relationship side, management side. And they're the ones who usually kill it in the flat rate system. And I don't like that. I don't want a sales tech to be the ones who always kill it. I want it to be a guy who's good with hand, dealing with people, is also really good at his job, and is very thorough, and helps take care of his buddies, and is good at training, and helps make your organization better. That's the guy who should be making the most money. And so as long as you set up your flat rate pay system so that it does that, then great. That's awesome. I just was burned early on, and I'm still getting over it. And I think eventually I'll end up there. Have you ever experienced a service technician who would repair something that should have been replaced because they were on flat rate? It's usually the other way around. That's the argument that people give is they sell stuff whenever it doesn't need to be sold. But I feel like there's a possibility that somebody might change out a compressor whenever that system should have been replaced. It should have been at least offered to be replaced. 
for those of you who don't understand, I'm assuming most of you know what flat rate is, but it's basically you pay someone a flat amount of minutes usually to do a job regardless of how long it takes them. This is the way mechanics often work. The assumption is that you're going to do everything the right way. It's just if you're faster and you're better at what you do, then you're going to get it done quicker, right? That's the idea. And so guys who are more efficient or better at their jobs, they're going to make more money. And the challenge there is, is that it motivates people to do a lot of repairs and to do them very quick. Let's be honest. That's what that model rewards. It's people doing a lot of repairs and doing them very quick. And if you add in the other two, also having some good customer service, being able to sell things because they're going to be able to sell more repairs if they can do it that way, and also not having callbacks. So they're motivated to sell as many things as they can because they don't want anything to ever break. That's the challenge there. And you bring up a good point, which is where having some sort of sales spiff model in place to balance it is almost necessary so that that way they kind of have that balanced motivation between a sale or a repair where either way they're doing okay in that system, which ideally you would have people who do the right thing regardless of the monetary incentives. But we just know that monetary incentives do play into people's behavior. And so as a manager, you have to be very thoughtful about what you put in place. So that way you're rewarding good things and you're punishing bad things. That's the goal. What would you say in response to someone who would argue that paying a technician flat rate neglects the management's role. So basically you're making them manage themselves. If they're not billing out, they're not getting paid. So it's, you don't have to worry about a guy sitting on a clock or sitting on a job versus if you're not billing it out, then you're not getting paid. So there presents an argument that maybe your manager is not doing the management job that they're being paid to do. And that's sort of a convoluted thing there. As much as possible, you want people to be self-motivated. You want them to have systems in place that reward them for doing the right thing. It doesn't mean that they do the right thing because they're rewarded, but as much as possible as a manager, you want to put things in place that reward people for doing the right thing. And the right thing is the right thing by the customer. It's the right thing by you as a business owner. You see a lot of technicians. So let's just look at it this way, okay? Let's look at the old model, the old time and materials model, right? What motivations did a technician have back in the old time and materials model? Well, their motivation was to stay on a job as long as they possibly could, right? I mean, there was no reason to move on to the next job. You move on to the next job, you're not getting paid to drive, right? I mean, the company's not getting paid to drive. So that's the old time materials model. But then we go to the model like my business is, which is a flat rate model. And so you bring in a lot of time and materials techs who are still using that type of mindset, but now they're billing out flat rate. They're not getting paid flat rate, but they're billing out flat rate. Now it's imperative that if they're going to do a compressor, that they need to do it in a relatively fair amount of time. If that compressor, if we've bid into that price six hours to do that compressor, well, then they need to do it within six hours. Otherwise, the company's not making money on that job. They have no motivation to do it other than just being altruistic towards the company. And instead, the technician chooses to be largely altruistic towards the customer. And so this is when technicians will give them parts away free and add a little refrigerant just because, oh, it's a little bit. It's not a big deal. Doing things for the customer and ignoring the company. And so those end up being highly unprofitable companies. Whereas at least in the time material model, Sure, you can be slimy all day long and just stand out in the yard, smoke a cigarette, but at least the company's not losing any money when you're doing that because you're still billing out for it. Now that's unethical towards the customer. And so the design of the flat rate system is that it's both. So you're motivated now to take care of the company and you're only charging the customer what you're charging them, so you're not going to take advantage of them. But now the challenge is that now you're motivated to not do things in the properly technically speaking. And maybe you're even tempted to do things that aren't needed to be done so that way you can make a little more on flat rate. So those who kind of make this claim that the flat rate pay, flat rate billing is the immoral method just are ignoring that every method has its areas that technicians can take advantage, right? My model, the technicians can take advantage of me easily. In the time materials model, they can take care of the customer easily when it comes to milking the clock. And the third model where your flat rate billing and flat rate pay, they can take advantage of the customer easily by doing things that aren't necessary, right? Or not doing all the proper processes when they do the repair. Yeah, skipping steps along the way. So to answer the question about managing or not managing, well, you have to, managers have to manage no matter what. They just have to manage different things. So if you're not having to motivate people as far as getting them out the door and getting them working, well, now you got to work on them on as far as they're making sure that they're being honest and making sure that they're doing all their proper processes. A flat rate billing, flat rate pay company, like your company, Tersh, your mm-hmm. primary job as a manager is making sure that everybody's doing their job the right way, following all the proper processes, and to make sure that they're honoring the customer with the repairs that they're doing and the decisions that they're making in the field. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I do is if my guys change out contactors and capacitors, the contactors and capacitors come back to me. Some guys might see that as a bad thing, 
but it's just my checks and balance as part of my procedures that I want to see the contactors and capacitors. And so it just keeps an honest man honest, in my opinion. Sure. There's lots of good ways you can manage this process if you care to. That's a perfect way of doing it. If you have people who are out there, and this is true even in my company, every once in a while I test an EVAP coil. Somebody says, oh, that EVAP coil was leaking, especially if it was warranty or whatever. I'll bring it back and I'll test it, see if it's leaking. I'll ask guys sometimes, oh, you're using a micron gauge? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, show me. Show me your pump, show me your micron gauge, show me how you hook it up. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. I've had that conversation before. <laughs> just show me how you do it. Just right now. You don't have to be at a job. Just show me right now. Just pull it out of your truck and hook it up like you would. And if you see the guy fumbling, like, oh, uh, you know he doesn't do it. Mm-hmm. Or ask him how many microns he pulls it down to. Well, I mean, my guys, because... Yeah, because of you. Heck, I'm HVAC school. They know the right answer to give. They know the Sunday school answer. You know, the answer is... <laughs> No, the answer is 500, boss. You know, no, it's, I don't want them to give me a Sunday school answer. I want them to show me how they do it. And those are the types of things that you do in a business that's more flat rate in order to make sure to keep people honest. The system doesn't create the problem. What creates the problem is the management model that goes along with the system. What are you watching for? What are you doing? That's kind of my point. I want to see whenever someone presents the argument to me about paying flat rate, by the way, like Brian said, my company, we pay flat rate and we bill out flat rate, including the installs. They're paid out flat rate also. And each additional item is an add-on for time-wise. Whenever I get into a discussion with someone about flat rate and why time and material is better than flat rate, because it's more honest person, you have to manage one way or the other. If you're a good manager, you're going to be a good manager on time and material. If you're a good manager, you're going to be a good manager on flat rate. Uh, If you put forth the same amount of effort, you're not going to catch every single little thing. And if you have dishonest people, you need to get rid of them anyways. But sometimes it's an honest mistake. And in that case, in the customer's best interest, you would take care of the customer. But the things that I look for is if you have a technician who is changing out a contactor every time they go on a maintenance Maybe they went to a slew of contactors in an area that had issues with ants. You and I talked about that recently. But maybe they're just upselling a contactor. They're getting an easy 32 minutes because that's typically what your flat rates books pay out for contactors is 32 minutes or 28 minutes. Just really monitoring the parts that are being changed out on the service tickets is a big thing for me. I want to know what was changed out, why it was changed out. And if you can get into a habit of recording before and afters, like if you have an amp draw, if you're checking voltage before and after a part's changed out, microfarads, it's a lot easier, especially if they know that that's being monitored. It's a lot easier to keep someone honest that's already honest. If they're not honest, then they're going to try and figure out a way to game the system. But in that case, if you suspect that, you have your normal conversation with them. And if it continues, then they need to be dismissed from the company. This turned into a very different kind of conversation. But when you watch these shows where the guys get caught for doing shady practices and they said that the capacitor was leaking combustible fluid or whatever. Yeah, I've seen one of those. That was crazy. (laughs) And a lot of these cases, I think the technician is literally just that ignorant. I think he's deluded himself to believe that he's doing the best thing for the customer by doing what they do. Now, there are total slugs out there who just literally don't care about taking advantage of people, obviously. But I think there are the bulk of really bad technicians have convinced themselves that what they're doing is the right thing to do. They just don't understand anything. In cases like that, you as a manager have to have good metrics to show what's going on out there in the field, you know, what parts are they changing, all that sort of thing. But you also just have to know your people. Like when you sell someone this contactor and you told them that this was bad and you're looking at one that just looks like a normal contactor, what did you tell them? What did you say? Oh, well, I said, you know, look at the points here. They're all corroded and pitted. That's corroded and pitted to you? That's how they look after like 10 runs. What are you talking about? And those are the types of things that as a human, you have human interactions. And the metrics, the data helps support that as you get larger. So it kind of helps you point out those outliers of somebody who may be doing something shady. But as a smaller business... It's a combination of seeing the metrics, but more so really just kind of seeing what's going on. Because on the other side of the equation, if you have somebody who never quotes a contactor, like they've gone to 100 maintenances, I see guys who do this. I'll watch a string of 10 maintenances where every single one tested everything, all good, tested everything, all good, tested everything. It's like, no, 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 no. You're not doing a good maintenance. You are not being thorough. If you're finding every maintenance you go to, you tested everything and all is good. That's not the real world. You're not going to go through 10 and not have one that has an issue disconnect that's, that's failing or come and pull it off the wall or a capacitor that's 
more than 10% weak or a dirty evaporator coil, something. Or a dog's done peed on the coal. <laughs> right, or a big hole in the coil where the dog peed on it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so it's both sides of that, and that's what an attentive manager does. So yeah, I would say anybody who thinks that metrics are a replacement for management or flat rate systems are a replacement for management, they absolutely aren't. It just tailors what you have to be looking for and what you have to be managing. And a good manager is somebody who knows what people are going to try to get away with, knows what the tendencies can be, and looks it full in the face and figures out a way to deal with it instead of hides in the corner. Because I've been both in my day. I've been a really good manager sometimes, and sometimes I've been a manager who hides when I know things aren't going right and just kind of hopes it all turns out okay. And hint, that doesn't work out well. Just an FYI, it doesn't fix itself. What do you say to the technicians who just really get angry whenever they're being tracked? You have a guy that comes into the company and he's been at other companies that they took advantage of the tracking or in their opinion, they took advantage of the tracking. So now they are super anti-tracking, like don't keep track of me. Don't put a GPS in my van. Don't track my phone. What's the response to that type scenario? I understand, actually. My natural response as an owner of a business is to say, well, (laughs) That's how it goes, right? It's my way or the highway. You don't have to work here. You know, this is how it goes at my place because I need to keep track of things. But on the other hand, I think it's important to be empathetic because I knew a lot of really good old time techs. And one of the guys, I've mentioned this guy all the time. His name was Dave Barefoot. He would get done with a call and he would go park and he would smoke a cigarette and then he would call in standby. But the guy was like 55 years old. And am I saying that that's a good way to do business? No, it's not. But they needed Dave Barefoot. Mm Mm-hmm. They didn't know they needed him, but they needed him. And so if they were to punish him because he wasn't working their system, well, that would be their loss. And in fact, there was another guy, his name Mike Guilford, where that ended up kind of happening. And I don't know the whole story. He was one of my early heroes as well. And he was just a really good technician, but he didn't want to be pushed all the time. He cared about doing the right thing and he liked his job, but he didn't want to be pushed all the time. And I think companies need to make room for those types of people. But here's the thing, a little hint, if you're one of those types of technicians. If you really don't want to be tracked and you don't want to be pushed all the time and you don't want to have to do a bunch of paperwork and have numbers fall on you everywhere you go, then you better be darn good because then there's room for you. But if you're mediocre and you're still trying to make your own rules, well, then you're not going to have a job. You have to be really, really good in order to earn that right. There are some guys who earn that right, and it would be best if they could have that conversation totally forthright. Most of them, I don't know, necessarily have the self-awareness to be able to have that conversation, but I wouldn't tell an owner, hey, if you got somebody who's not going to play by this set of rules, then they got to go, because I use my brother as an example. I don't know if you know Nathan at all, and he'll probably hear this, but so be it. <laughs> Hello, Nathan. <laughs> Hey, Nathan. Nathan is an amazing technician, and he is a great person to have in the organization. Everybody trusts him. He will work until 4 in the morning if he needs to to get a job done, and he'll get up at 6 and go and do another one. He'll take people's on call for them. You could trust him with anything. He knows what he's doing, but he does the worst paperwork in the whole world, and he hates being tracked, and he hates being pushed. And I can't change that about him. I would be a fool if I said, oh, I'm better than you because I'm more corporate. I have my processes. I would strongly encourage owners to have that perception. When you have a new guy who comes in, eh, I would say no. I would say, eh, new guy, no. You got, you have to work with the system a little bit. If you've shown that you're really, really good, I might work with you a little bit. Like if you have a specialty like refrigeration or controls or something, I might work with you a little bit. If you're just coming in, you're going to be a technician, you're going to try to dictate to me how it's going to work. Nah, I'm not going to hire you. But if you've proven yourself to me over the years and I just see that you really struggle with some of this stuff, I'm going to give you a pass to a point. There comes a point where you can't allow it anymore. But I think we do ourselves a disservice in service businesses when we get a little too corporate sometimes. It's kind of like in the football teams. I read this book about a journalist. This was back in the 60s, 50s or 60s. A journalist who went and played third string quarterback for the Detroit Lions is a book called Paper Lion. It's a great book. And he got on a training camp for the Lions, and he talked about how the veterans were held to just a totally different standard. I mean, they can come in when they wanted to. They didn't have to attend practices and all that. And on the face of it, you're like, oh, that's not a good organization. They're not setting a good example. But I don't know. There's some of that that I think is valid as long as it's based on performance, not based on just seniority. People who are like, oh, I deserve it because I've been here long enough. That's baloney. But if you really are good and you really have proven yourself and you just have this particular hang ups, then I don't know. I say give them a pass. Most of the guys that I see present that argument are guys who are less than two years in the industry. A lot of times even less than that. Right. Get out of here. Yeah, exactly. Kick rocks. I'm not going to play into that game. You come across more like you're hiding something than you are that you're stuck in your ways and you want to do a certain way. And that's as an owner, as a manager, you need to be able to have pretty authentic conversations with your employees about how this works. 
like how business works, how the employee employer relationship works. There's a reason why I'm running the business and there's a reason why you're not. And it's not because I'm better than you. It's because I own a business and you don't. Right. And there's good things about running a business and there's good things about working for a business. And you chose to work for a business. And when you choose to work for a business, I've got to make money. The business has to make money. And I'm the one who sets those terms. That's how it goes. And if you prove yourself as an owner where you care and you show that you value people and you're not a jerk and you go to bat for them when they need you and when they're having a hard time, you're the one who shows up and you're the one who's there to hold their hand when things are going downhill. Maybe not literally hold their hand, but you get the point. Then you earn that right as well to be a little bit hard. That's how business needs to be. But yeah, if you have people who are trying to dictate to you and you smell it, I'm telling you when you're interviewing somebody and they're, it's like they're interviewing you and they're less than two years, maybe less than five years even, don't hire them. Just don't do it. It's not going to go well. You would not take that advice of Andrew Greaves in his uh, recent hiring video? Right. If they have a pulse, go ahead and hire them. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm going to skip that. I've certainly made mistakes in that way, but I've also found a lot of really good people by sticking with it. And if I find somebody who I don't think is a good fit because they're interviewing me or they're saying, oh, I don't want to be tracked or I don't like that. I guess I'll just say all these moralizing things like, oh, that flat rate stuff, that's bull crap or whatever. It's like, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but... That's just how it is here, and don't judge a book by its cover. And say, man, that I'm not going to judge you by your cover. Don't judge me by my cover. I think the, the track record is what speaks. That's what speaks volumes about how a business is run. And that's where when it comes down to management and all these sorts of things, people will pick out a particular system, and they'll say, well, that's a good system. That's a bad system. And there are some systems that are better than others, but the proof is in the pudding. Is the business making money? Are the customers happy? Is there good morale in the company? And do they have a track record of technical excellence? Those are really the questions that you ask. And if they do, well, then it's a good company. And if they don't, then it's not as good of a company. Not the best company. Not the best. Cool. Well, we got off topic a little bit, but it was really good information, I feel like, on flat rate. Because there's a lot of people who are just super cloudy on it. They have been time and material for so many years that they just don't see the benefit of flat rate. I have some friends who are time and material and are commercial they just don't see the value of going flat rate in the commercial industry. And it's predominantly light commercial. So I've tried conveying my opinions on that. But the topics that we spoke about today, I tried playing devil's advocate a little bit. It was probably wasn't until halfway through the podcast before it came out that I actually am a flat rate guy. Yeah, I sort of revealed that. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, that's perfectly fine. I don't mind that at all. I tried playing devil's advocate a little bit just so that people didn't think that I was like super gung-ho for flat rate. Um, I really want to just know both sides of the argument because if there's a better way to do it, then by all means, I want to do it the better way. I don't want to do it the way that I've always done it because that's the way I've always done it. And I know that there's a lot of other guys out there that are the same way. And a lot of people that are listening to this podcast, they want to know better ways of doing things. And that's the reason why we're doing this podcast. This podcast isn't just for managers and owners who want to scale their business. We're not just here to generate revenue so that we can grow companies to 150 employees. If you implement some of these things, all these things, there's a lot of these things that you can implement and just to make yourself more profitable. You can add more money to your checking account. And that's the name of the game. I mean, you just want to make enough money so you're not stressing. And so I want to reiterate the fact that we're not here just to teach you how to scale your company. We want to make sure that you're more efficient and less stress. So you can do the same thing quicker and more efficient and make more money and less stress. I mean, that's the ultimate goal, really. If you're in this industry, you know that scarcity is the norm. It, where people are constantly living paycheck to paycheck, whether it's an owner or whether you work in the business. And monetary scarcity, scarcity of hours, scarcity of customers, depending on season, obviously, is something that's just a yearly drumbeat in this business. And you can get on top of it. It just it does require some thought. It requires some planning. And I think you can make money with a wide different range of business models. I think that in general, the flat rate pay and flat rate billing model is probably one of the better models for uh, residential companies, residential and light commercial. When you get into refrigeration and larger commercial, then time and material becomes more prevalent. In fact, in my business, we do both. So when we're doing work for Walmart or Southeastern Grocers or Whole Foods, we're doing time and material. We're doing bid projects, but then when we're doing other things, we're doing a lot of time and material. That's just how that works in that world. But when we're doing residential stuff, we're doing the flat rate billing, and we still, like I said, do hourly pay. But I'm sure at some point, once we get to the place that we have structures in place that support flat rate pay, I'm sure we'll go that direction. 
The main thing is, is to put systems in place that attract the right type of people. And I think sometimes we have a wrong sense of even what the right type of people are. My service manager, he'll tell you he's a money motivated guy. You know, he's very competitive and he likes to make money, but he's not the wrong kind of money motivated because he's not money motivated at the expense of doing what's right. I've never seen him do the wrong thing, treat somebody wrong or shortchange a customer or do something the wrong way because of it. He wants to make money and he wants to win, but he wants to do it the right way. And I think there's room for people like that and performance based pay is really motivating to those types of people. Whereas there's other types of people who are not motivated by performance-based pay and they feel kind of sucks part of their soul out. And I understand that too, because I'm a little more that way. Like I'm not all the way that way, but I'm a little bit more. I don't like having to do paperwork and I don't like having to think about details of pay and all that type of stuff. I just want to go fix stuff and then make money doing it. But I understand both sides of the equation, but you just have to understand as for a business, you have to create the model that results in the best end result, which is good customer service best employee morale you can have, and still making a good solid profit at the end of the day. I agree. All right, cool. You want to wrap this one up? Sure. Well, we appreciate you sticking around to the end. If you want to hear more, obviously subscribe. iTunes, Google Play Store, the Stitcher app. Leave us a review. Hopefully it's a five star. You can go to the HVAC school podcast. If you're looking to reach out to us, we have a Facebook group, Facebook page. The page is more of you have to reply to our whatever our posts are. They're pretty strict about that on Facebook. But if you join a group, we can interact. We ask questions. You ask questions and have a good old time just answering each other's questions. Just join the group. It's a good old time. If you want to learn more about all of our network, the Blue Collar Roots Network, You can go to bluecollarroots.com and check out the other podcasts. We have several of them. Zach Ciotta and Ralph Wolf, they have HVAC Shop Talk. The Tool Pros podcast, that is Brent Ridley and Billy Noth. We look forward to uh, talking with everyone and uh, look forward to all of our future podcasts together. All right. Thanks, Durst. We'll talk at you soon.